This question gives us a system defined by its impulse response. So we're given a system's impulse response H of T. Now an impulse response is simply the output of a system when the input happens to be an impulse. So if X of T was an impulse centered at zero, the output would be the impulse response. So y of t would be an impulse of weight 2 at t equals 1. So y of t is the impulse response. So that's what's given in the question. The question then asks, what would the output be if the input were an impulse. Now, if the input was an impulse, the output, by definition, would be the impulse response. So the answer to part A, by definition, would be y of t equals 2 delta t minus 1. That's by definition. OK, so let me, let me write that down. This is by definition, by, so by definition of the um, of the uh, impulse response. Part B. What's the output if the input was a scaled version of an impulse? So if the input wasn't simply a um, delta function, it was five times a unit impulse. So if we use the scaling function, or the scaling property, why are we allowed to use the scaling property of the system? Because we're told the system is linear. And a linear system is additive, and it is homogeneous. And homogeneous means it accepts scaling. So we can use the scaling property and say the output is simply going to be five times the impulse response. So it's five times two, that's ten, times t minus one. So it's almost the same as that, except we're multiplying by five. Okay, next question says, what's the output if the input was a scaled and shifted impulse? So now our input is no longer this impulse centered at zero. Our input is now a scaled and shifted impulse. So our impulse is now here at two. So because we know the system is time invariant, it means that if there's a shift in the input, that should result in a shift in the output. So we can say using time invariance, we know that y of t needs to be shifted by two seconds. So it'll be exactly the same as what we wrote in part B, but it's shifted by a further two seconds. So we can write it as, if I zoom in a bit here, it'll be 10 times an impulse at t minus 1 minus 2. So that minus 2 is that minus 2. And then we can simplify that and say t minus 3. So two seconds coming from here and one second from the original impulse response. So that would be the output for part C. For part D, we now have two impulses. One of them, or both of them, are quite familiar. 
So um, this one is that, and this is that. So we have the outputs or the inputs from A and C all going into D. So how do we, how do we treat a system like that? Now, because it's a linear system, we know it's a linear system from the question, when we add different combinations of inputs, we can simply add the output. So I can take the output from, um, from A here, and I can take the output from D, and I can add them together. So I can say the output here, oops, is the sum of the two outputs. So I'll just make that clear that I'm getting this from there and this from there. And why can I do that? It's because of linearity. And finally, we're asked, is this system causal? Now, the condition for causality, okay, a causal system condition would be that the impulse response is zero for all negative time. Remember we said a causal system will never anticipate the input? In other words, it will never respond to something in negative time. So if there's an impulse at t equals zero, you won't expect to have an output before t equals zero. So let's look at um, the impulse response here. The impulse response given in the question is an impulse at t equals one. Okay, so this is my impulse response. And that is zero for t less than zero, so for this side of the time axis, it's zero. So we can say, therefore, the system is causal. So we can say system is causal.